May I present the former governor of California and the uh, man who would be president on the Democratic ticket, uh, former Governor Jerry Brown. to our program today, uh, fresh out of a very contentious meeting with uh, politically active Jews here in New York who are mad as hell at you for even suggesting that you would put Jesse Jackson on the ticket. Some angry uh, Jewish voters might uh, irreverently say you're running with the Jaime Town uh, uh, vice president. How do you expect to possibly get any piece of the 25 to 35 percent of the Jewish vote? That's how much it may be in this primary. Uh, when you have uh, already announced your interest in uh, Jackson as a Veep. Because I think people who take a few moments to reflect uh, know the extent of the crisis in this country, know how failed and empty the political process has become, know the despair and the hopelessness of those black children who are growing up in neighborhoods with bombed out buildings like the end of World War II, and they know that Reverend Jackson has had a tremendous record in the African American community, and they know the Democratic Party has to heal itself, and the divisions we're experiencing today are the very divisions that exist in this audience, right. in this city, and across this country. And we might as well get them out into the open and start talking about them, you. because the feelings of ill will, they're out there, black and white. And we've got to get it out there and heal it if we're going to be a strong country to protect Israel, to support uh, the freedom uh, aspirations of people in South Africa and make this world work for uh, all of us. You also are on record as saying, knock off, as you put it, those settlements on the West Bank. Uh, you would like to see uh, the Israeli government cease the development of settlements on the West Bank. Is that not so? Uh, look, I'd like to see the peace process work. I'd like to see the $10 billion guarantee uh, extended, for, extended yeah. without conditions. And if it is, then, then you know about the fungible argument. Then they'll have more money to build uh, settlements. I understand And that. we have uh, all the way back to Jimmy Carter. Right. See this as belligerent, as uh, an unfair right. intervention into... And everybody's the, concerned about it. Everyone is. And this uh, country but, has always said this is an impediment to peace. Are you That's prepared to have... say that you agree with James Baker and George Bush on the issue of cessation of the settlements? Uh, no, I'm not going to agree with Bush and Baker on, on this or any other major issue because what is required... <laughs> first, I'm running against them. And I'm not about to agree with them. Uh, um, now, here's why on this issue. Look, we don't want to pre-negotiate here. This is a tough... This is a situation that goes back for millennia. And you have different interpretations, different okay, religions, different you spirits. say, I wish they'd knock off those settlements. Do you yeah. continue to so hold of course that I'd position? Say that. I, uh, you think it's a better idea if they stop? It enhances the peace process. Uh, I think it does. Right. But I'm not going to start pressuring uh, Israel I'm, because the, the Arabs haven't yet uh, stopped the boycott. I mean, this thing is, is a division here right. which is not going to get resolved tomorrow. It's going to take step by step over a lot of years and we've got to push this thing along Bush did make an advance for it, we've got to keep it going don't pressure Israel, don't pressure the Arab side keep it moving and that's why unconditional support for the loan guarantees make a lot of sense yes. Governor, you cannot, you cannot possibly lead this charge of coalitions of coalitions <clears throat> this widening tide of resentment that you call on to uh, attach itself to your candidacy bearing the flag of a flat tax at 13 percent. It is not going to work. You have been thumped by, the, by uh, uh, the former president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, people who should be your friends. Pat Moynihan gets up in front of uh, reporters in Washington and says in his own inimitable way, it will destroy the most successful social program of the 20th century, Social Security. Why? Why the left should support the flat tax? What is it you wanted to say in answer to what people think will cost the poor more than the rich, save money for the rich, 
and increase the taxes of the middle class. You're sunk with this one, Jerry. It's a bad idea. Ralph Nader has given himself permission to go in print as saying you didn't think it through. Oh, no, we thought it through. And just Nader, Carter, and yes, Jesse Jackson don't agree with me on this, but so what? I'm running for president, and I've got an idea here. And here's what uh, the Wall Street Journal says in an article by Alexander Coburn, a, a liberal, and Robert Pollan, a very uh, liberal economist. With his flat tax, Brown has prompted the only serious intellectual debate of the Democratic primaries. This is already a considerable achievement. And they go on and they show in here how people are going to benefit by lower taxes and the country is going to have the saving and investment to get out of this stagnation that's killing us. But you and it's to going to work. But you Fairness and simplicity. But you agree that it is going to require some major changes. You can't get it done with a 13% flat tax. Can you give us that? Oh, look, no, no, wait a minute. If you have a 13%, there's one thing that all the poobahs and the big shots always don't know because they live in this dream world of 200 and 300,000 million dollar salaries. For most people in this audience, the biggest tax you all pay is your payroll tax, FICA, right? And you don't deduct your home mortgage, you don't deduct your New York city tax, state tax, any tax. That is a flat, regressive tax on middle class and lower income people. We, what we do is change the tax code and substitute a 13% tax that you can deduct rent from, whatever your rent is, deduct it from your federal tax, and secondly, you can deduct mortgage interest and charity. But you and that means if you're in the lower 20%, your effective rate is about 7%, and if you're in the top um, uh, income bracket, uh, top 20%, it's closer to the 13. And it so would, it is a progressive tax. And it would end Social Security. No, it will, oh, it will protect it. Right now, Social Security is being ripped off by the Congress to the tune of 50 billion a year. This will guarantee that we protect Social Security. <laughs> Uh, and can Governor. I just say one more thing, the, the larger picture? Look, everybody knows this economy is flat on its back. It's not working. There's not enough saving. We're running a $350 billion deficit. America's not competing. The tax code has hundreds of billions of dollars of little loopholes that have been bought and paid for by all the corrupt lobbying and campaign fundraising to the tune of billions over the last 20 years. What we say is, that's the wet blanket. That's the ball in the chain that's holding us back. Sweep it away, make us make one tax, which is progressive. The less you earn, the lower your percentage, rising up to a total of 13, yeah. which will then lower it on everybody, and then shift the burden principally to business with a 13 percent tax of 13 percent business tax and i recommend anyone read this wall street journal article by some liberal economists who say it's good now there's one more point the tax code is only the efficient engine to generate the economic growth then we have to do something else we've got new wealth coming now because we changed the tax mess we need labor law reform we need employee stock ownership and we have to get this country going to put our investment right here the reason why factories are leaving to mexico because the management working for an international corporation will protect its foreign shareholders at the expense of Terrytown and Flint and American workers. And I want people to give their blood, sweat, and tears to a business to start earning some of the stock right. and the ownership. And that's called employee stock options. And if we have that, then we're going to start reducing the gap between the management and the working people who are doing most of the Governor work. Brown. That's what I aim. Equity, fairness, and simplicity. Governor, hey. you Governor. And I'm sorry I had to talk so fast, but yeah. you, you have a way of speeding me up. And well, I'm going to just uh, take a glass of water here and let you do. talk. I want Please, to do. You talk. Please do. Please <laughs> do. Governor, you, uh, Governor Clinton was here yesterday and liked some of my questions better than others. It should um, I know. So okay. uh, here, here we go. Hit me. Governor, there's a... Uh, if, you, if you became president, you would be only the third man in the history of this country to enter the White House as a bachelor. Um, there is a, uh, which doesn't make it, uh, which makes it newsworthy, maybe good for the press. But there is a, there, as there was when you was, were governor, who are you? Who is this man? You went who, to, who is yeah. you, <laughs> you went to Africa with Linda Ronstadt. Did you go anywhere else with anybody else? Who, what, what is, what is your leisure? What, what kind of person are you? I'm almost finished, Governor. <laughs> Comes now the Washington Post with an article by Andrew Ward. 
This is as powerful a newspaper and as establishment a newspaper this as we is, have. This is and the Bastille even, that we're hammering that's down. That's true. These, they don't these even... Are, they these listen. are the people who protect the check bounces and the midnight right. pay raises it, it and the rip-off. And this it should be it. said that right the there. Post... The Post does not give us the benefit of knowing who the hell is Andrew Ward. Who is he? I, I, he's a Wash I, I looked this up. He's a Washington State writer. He's an insider. But, right. But this is a very, very nasty left hook from nowhere. He says, I'm cold. You're not only cold, cold. you're the kind of guy who goes home mm. in your Porsche, borrows money from your wealthy father, scolds him. For, I got scolds a, him. I'm almost I'm finished. Mercury. Please let me just finish it. Mercury that I have. Listen. <laughs> Scolds oh. your father for being part of establishment oh. values and tells your mother how to make better coffee. You're a crank. You're stuck in middle age adolescence. And, uh, uh, yeah, this is all here. How, well, how do you respond to these kinds of caricatures of you? You have the floor, sir. So should I look at them or look at the camera? Or I don't know how you do this. God, you know, I was sort of blocking it out for a while there. Uh, you want to know, um, who are yeah, you? Who am I? Well, as Jimmy Carter once said, I'm Jerry Brown from California. I was just the chief executive of the largest state in the union. It's equivalent to the eighth largest country in the world. We governed in a way of honesty. The taxes were lowered. Two million jobs were created. It was innovative. It was creative. If you want to know, do I go out with girls? Yes, I do. Do you want their, do you want their names and their phone numbers? They're probably watching this show. I'm not going to give them to you. Um, is it... Can I be a good president <clears throat> not having a wife? I'll tell you. I grew up in a family. My father had a wife, and that's how I came to be here. Um, but, uh, I'll tell you this. Politics... If it's anything like this presidential campaign, it's like what I've experienced, it is such a full-time commitment that I'm probably doing some woman and some set of children a great favor by uh, well, sparing them the burden. It is true that <clears throat> it is also... Look, the yeah. kind of people that run for politics and president, this is... Yeah, yeah. a lot of what you say, I mean, look it's, at all these people. It's a crazy business. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it, if you should, have a totally satisfying personal life, you might not get into this kind of work. Continuing. <laughs> to, <laughs> um, Should I say but, that? But uh, you have, you have so... Hey, Dad, I didn't say it. No. Almost finished. <laughs> Mom, you, it's, look, it's this, I've had an experience here. I grew up in a political family. I yes. know how it works. I know It's as do. American as apple pie. I went to public schools, but West Portal. I went to St. Brendan's Grammar School. But that will make people more curious about you as they were when you served as governor. Not surprisingly, in print came, uh, is he gay? He's not marrying. Holy cow. Never in your, pu in your adult life has there ever been any suggestion that you were gay. Not only that, I know you want to live in a world where it wouldn't matter. You will not be outed by any enraged, politically active gay community. So having set that aside, what, what interests do you have? And are you, as Mr. Ward might suggest, quoting Orwell, interested in non-attachment and avoiding the pain, <laughs> wanting to escape the pain of living, <clears throat> and above all, from love, sexual or non-sexual, which is hard work. Mr. Ward, whoever he is, sees you as not interested in what most of us would consider to be the normal entitlements of the human animal. <laughs> Let me say this. Uh, I think most human beings would like to reduce the pain in their life. And we do that through love, through companionship, through doing what we're good at, by being in a community. And we're in a society <clears throat> with a lot of anonymity, uh, with a lot of stress, with a lot of materialism, with a lot of emptiness. Uh, I started out early in life, I went into a Jesuit seminary, uh, semi I almost said cemetery in some ways. <laughs> you could say that, it was a seminary. And it was, it, you could say that, it was a rejection of, of a life that, that uh, I had been brought up in. And I sought a, a spiritual, a, a contact with God, with a, a better life, as best I could understand it. That's different. Uh, but I'll tell you this, it, it built uh, character, it gave me an awareness of a, of a Catholic social and uh, spiritual tradition that serves me well now. When I'm in this crazy, mad universe <clears throat> of presidential microphones, cameras, craziness, celebrityness, it is very good to have a grounding 
in, in moral and spiritual principles that can keep your f feet on the ground. And the fact that, uh, that I don't have a, a family and I'm not married, yeah, you ought to take that into account. Uh, but I've grown up, I have a family. I have three sisters. Uh, I have lots of cousins and nieces and nephews. Uh, I, I like politics. I also like, uh, I'm attracted by the religious life. I went to, to Japan. I spent six months first studying with Jesuits and, and then uh, with some Buddhists, a spiritual meditation. I, I want to find the deepest part of what life presents. And then I left and I went to Calcutta, India, because I knew just having something in yourself doesn't mean anything. You have to test it in the fire of compassion serving other people. And I worked for three and a half weeks. No one, when I first went there, no one knew who I was. It only came out because my mother had a heart attack and they called the ambassador and they found out where I was and they found me. But before that, I was totally anonymous. I went there and I showed up and they said, go to work over here. And every morning I got up and I bathed the, uh, dying men. I cleaned their bedpans, almost to the point of wanting to vomit. And uh, I, I washed the floors and I, and I cut hair and I held people's hands. And some of them died and some of them lived. And I did that because I wanted to, to, to touch what I hadn't experienced. And I wanted to see people who'd given their whole life to the service of God in, in the poor. And I wanted to take that because I come from a cynical, political, empty, meaningless process that is politics. And a wealthy family. Well, then my father, when he was DA, uh, made $7,000, and then he went 15000 and he was upper middle class, but it wasn't any big wealthy thing. I went to a public school, and St. Brendan's Grammar School charged $15 a semester per family when I was going to school. So don't, let's not exaggerate it. But I found, when I went there, and, and what I did was I really got back to my roots of what I was, what I was brought up with uh, as a child. And I saw the power of that woman and the volunteers and how it touched people's hearts. And it touched mine. And I came back and I want to try to in integrate that into this process called presidential politics. And it's that giving and it's that part of me. It doesn't open up enough. I'm not a perfect person. I got a lot of flaws and scar tissue as a politician. But you know something? I'm willing to talk about it, expose it and change and improve to the extent I can. I know this system is it's corrupt, it's failing, and people are suffering. And if I can touch people's hearts, maybe I can make a difference. It's not about me. It's about all of us taking our country back that we love and, and making it we'll stand up for what it believes. Be back in just a moment. Please. Hi. Governor? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Governor, I'm just out let here me with just, my friends. Let me just, uh, as you know, <clears throat> I am wise in all things. <laughs> you cannot have this nomination. You have Ron Brown, the leader of your party, saying, <laughs> come on, don't cross the line. You scare the hell out of the establishment of the party that you have not forsaken. You want the Democratic Party to be with you. You have now come out with a flat tax which is being pilloried by main respected liberals in the Senate and elsewhere. You can destroy the Clinton candidacy by beating him in New York, Pennsylvania, any one of those states. Those two would do it. And you could win all the rest of the primaries and still wind up in July at the convention with not enough delegates. So here is what could happen. The, the coalition of mad as hell people that have rallied to your 800 number show up at Madison Square Garden in July, knock on the door, and the party regulars are not going to let you in. We're in for one hell of a, of a, of a TV show in the summer that's going to beat all the reruns. If you collide with <coughs> Ron Brown and the regular Democrats, you're going to lose. Is that a question? <laughs> All right, if I, not if I collide, what about if we collide? What about if we collide? What about a Democratic Party that represents those millions of people that don't show up anymore? Uh, that is the way we're going to beat Mr. Bush, to get the millions of people who think it's a ripoff, who don't like the bouncing checks, who don't like the fact that these fellows raise their pay 40,000 bucks uh, while not accomplishing anything of any real significance, and say, hey, look, we want to take it back. I came up with this 800 number, which everyone ridiculed from the top of the political hierarchy to the national pundits, and all of a sudden, this month, we're going to be asking for the federal matching funds a greater amount than Clinton raised. In other words, the people are now more powerful than the elite. Yeah. You see? 
And yeah. that's very powerful because we started and we built this field and we said, look, if we build it, and taking it something from the movie, I don't want to be accused of plagiarism. Yeah. I said, well, build it and people will come. And now hundreds of thousands of people have called 1-800-426-1112. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. That means that the people are behind this campaign. It isn't just about Jerry yeah. Brown. It's people taking back their party. And right. if we can win this primary and the other states, Mr. Clinton yeah. is going to go away. But, and then we have a choice. Do you want someone who's gone through the fire of the primary process, or do you want somebody they've taken out of the Senate who hasn't right. said the, uh, the, the, the text? Right, so and I believe at that convention that right. I have a reasonable yes. chance of but getting the nomination. You are asking us to accept the legitimacy of your political conversion. It, well, it's, you can measure in months the distance between now and when you were raising millions for the Democratic Party. You were for a balanced budget amendment in 1980, which would destroy social programs in this country. You went on television and you said, hey, Israel, knock off those settlements. Now you're backing up from that, having just come from a very angry meeting with Jewish Can we voters do two here things in New York. Here's yeah. my point. Israel and a balanced budget are uh, on the same You're question. changing. You go with the wind. You're as political as anybody who ever announced for president. Okay. You will go this way, that way. You do change. You're not as pure as you claim. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, and I don't know how pure I've claimed to be. Well, you give me these three-barrel questions. You've got Israel, you've got uh, political fundraising. I'm talking about your changing. You change positions. Yeah, I know, but you left three contaminated comments that are still floating around out there. The floor is yours. Okay, good. Well, I just wanted to establish that. Uh, <laughs> the three things. Uh, I've, all administrations have said the, the settlements are impediment, but... I have consistently supported the loan guarantees without condition and moving the process forward without pushing Israel uh, in a way that free negotiates for them. Both people together, okay? That's what I've said consistently. Secondly, uh, this business of political fundraising, I've authored the Political Reform Act of 74. Yes, I've raised money. And yes, I raised money as recently as a few years ago for the Democratic Party because I wanted to build an institution that would revitalize itself and reach out to all the people that don't be a part of, aren't a part of politics. I found by rubbing my nose in this business, morning, noon, and night, not only did I gain 30 pounds by going to all these meals, not only did I finally figure out why they serve sherbet in the middle of the meal instead of at the end, and they call it sorbet. I don't know how many of you people get into that. But I found out, well, I mean, I knew it, but I didn't experience it because before when I was governor, yes, I went to fundraisers, but there was some governing in between. But as a party chair, it's every morning, every noon, every night, getting the money from the top 1%. And what that means is that, well, how many people here have never given $1,000 to a politician? Would you raise your hand? Yes. Just raise your hand. All right. Okay. It's complete separation from the people such as this. And politics has become, as I experienced it, away from these people. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Now, now here, let me just finish it. So what I saw is that what I'm noticing is is that politicians are spending all their time getting the thousand dollar checks to buy the TV we to manipulate it. people like this. So I yes. said, look, I'm going to do it another way. Because I saw what happened in 1990 in California. The candidate for governor lost, who was a Democrat. Our party registration went down and everybody said, Brown, you didn't raise enough money. So I went back and I thought about it and I said, baloney. What this party needs to do is go back to the grassroots and say, you control this party. And that's what I came up with, the 800 number, and not taking any check more than $100. Can we try? Let you control the party. We will take back this government. And all those folks in Washington will finally hear the voice of regular Americans. Yes. That was the idea. Now, can I try some, some brief ones here? Are you, for a are you for a voucher system that would allow public money... To, uh, uh, to gain access to private schools no. for our citizens. No. You're against No, that. because the public school needs to be supported. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get across the uh, and who, uh, sir? Briefly, sir. Um, if, if, if you were uh, really for energy conservation, would you have the guts to call for America to raise energy taxes so that we pay for gas what Europe pays? That would raise a tremendous amount of money. Some of it could go back to the poor people who pay for gasoline, and the rest of it would really build energy conservation. Uh, no, I don't think a gas tax really makes a difference. In fact, I think all the talk of raising the gas tax for conservation is baloney. It's just a way to get more money into government. And here's the reason. The cost of an automobile relative to the amount that you can increase the gas tax is too disproportionate. If you want to get people to buy fuel-efficient cars, put 
a fee on gas guzzlers. $1,000, all right? All right. Then rebate that fee to people who buy efficient cars. Give them a thousand dollars every time you buy an efficient car, and you know what? They'll get a lot more efficient cars because that's real money. That's a real incentive. It's oh. called fee bait. Right here, fee bait right is the way to get conservation. Right I'd like to know if you've if you've heard about the World Summit that's going to be in Rio in June, and if you could comment about that, your feelings about the environment. I'm concerned President Bush does not even plan on attending this summit. Uh, yeah, I think that we're turning the planet into a stinking junkyard, and that we're killing the possibility of a sustainable life as we know it. We've had, in my lifetime, I think we've gone from about one and a half billion people to 5.3 billion, we're going to nine billion, no matter what happens. We have to learn how to live efficiently and elegantly and in harmony with other, with other living species. And we can do that by the application of intelligence and imagination. I'd go to that Rio summit, I would commit to reduce CO2 emissions to the 1990 level. I think we can go below that and we can save money. The key to our economic future is efficiency. We're wasting uh, two to three hundred billion in energy we don't need. We're wasting uh, fifty percent of the paper and packaging that we're ending up in a landfill. We're wasting huge amounts of money in our medical care, and we're wasting money by putting people on welfare and in prisons because we don't guarantee a living family wage and jobs for all Americans. We can link environment and jobs together in a society that works. All we need to do is break up the gridlock down there in Washington. And Joe, next Monday on the eve of the New York Democratic primary, without reporters, without these media people that you can't trust anyway, <laughs> without, with, without an audience, without phone calls, what will they have to say when the agenda is their own on free TV? What will they have to say to each other, and what will their questions be? One more point. Governor Brown makes his second visit to the Donahue Show because before Connecticut, we invited both Governor Brown and Governor Clinton. Only Governor Brown accepted. So don't call us unfair here. Who's, who else is with me here? Uh, sir, you wanted to ask. Yes. Yeah, Jerry, I, I remember that you studied uh, as Brief a Jesuit. History. Oh, uh, um, uh, quickly, uh, how would you characterize your beliefs now, and how do you think that affects your politics? Mm -hmm. Are you a practicing Catholic? I call myself a practicing independent Catholic. <laughs> what is you don't That don't... means I don't make it every Sunday, but I do make retreats, and I follow the basic tradition and practice. Mm -hmm. Yes, you wanted to ask. But I ain't going to confession on this program. <laughs> I'd like to know if you have any particular agenda for improving education in this country. The foremost agenda to improve education is creating the opportunity of income security for every American family. It's the stress, the despair, the misery that's grinding down so many millions of kids, and that's affecting the schools. That's the first thing. But go ahead. Something else. Um with the low salaries, it seems that the best people are being pushed out of education because why, I mean, why would you be a teacher for $25,000 if you have grades good enough to go to law school or medical school? So I think, I mean, you have to encourage better people to get into education because only the most dedicated people are in education. Yeah. Sir. Specifically on that score, I believe the federal government should restore its historic funding uh, of local schools do it in a way that it doesn't just go to administration and bureaucracy and all these little categorical programs. Try to, to bring up the, the lower wealth districts because in some schools there's $6,000 of wealth behind each, uh, $6,000 every year for each child and in some it's two or 3000 So we want to try to make that as equal as possible. We did that in California. Uh, over 90% of the school districts are within $100 uh, of, of each other. Yep. And certainly teachers ought to be making more money and the system is so figured out that lawyers, investment bankers are at the top, and those who are in the front lines of presiding over and, and, and teaching and nurture, nurturing the kids of the future, they're not getting it. Right. That's the shift that a kind of in, uh, insurgent campaign that we have will make available. Because the teachers don't have as much clout, because those who are running this thing tend to be lawyers and investment bankers. Governor, <coughs> from your hometown of Los Angeles, comes uh, the political writer for the Los Angeles Times, Ronald Brownstein, to say in a thoughtful column which does not, I may say, necessarily trash you. Well, I that's, think... that's nice. All right, so don't get... Uh... I mean, you got to be thankful for small may favors. I may I share one paragraph with you? Is it, this is the worst one? No. no. Well, uh, you'll decide. Second's the worst. Think of the federal government as a house, Mr. Brownstein writes. Uh Clinton casts himself as the architect with the training to refurbish and renovate it. 
Brown wants to burn it down. Is your message too radical for our time? Well, let's just compare our architectural experience. Mr. Clinton is in Arkansas, where they're at the bottom in uh, medical insurance, in worker safety, in readiness of kids to go to school, uh, in pollution, and all the rest. Go to California, we're at the top in, in most of all those categories. I've had the experience right. uh, of a major state and world-class economy and the kind of innovation that people are saying, hey, under Brown, California became the world leader in innovative renewable energy. Bill That's Clinton, one statement I can say. He can't. Bill Clinton assumed the governorship of a state that was truly somehow lagging behind the rest of this what? nation. It still and, is. And wants you it to know. Still is. And wants you to know that he made the system work. No, that he, he was voted the best governor in the nation by his own governors. That he brought civil rights to people of all color in a very difficult situation in Arkansas. And yes, did he go to lunch occasionally with some movers and shakers in Arkansas? Of course he did. And so did you when you were governor of California. You're making a big thing out of this last place business. Bill Clinton says he has every right to be proud of having been uh, given the accolade by his own peers as he served as governor of Arkansas and that they've come a long way, baby, since he took office. To, the, to which you would reply. Okay, I think that modest applause says, uh, <laughs> says it all. Uh, <laughs> but it's a good try. Uh, here's the story. The story is, after 11 years, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, there is no civil rights statute. There's only two states out of 50 that have not been able to find the moral resources to enact a state civil rights statute. Also, uh, Arkansas is a right to work state. They weaken uh, trade unions and as a result their wages are so low that Governor Clinton went over to Korea and said come on over and locate your business here because wages are, are low, unions are weak and you'll just be able to get away with whatever you need. That's the reality of accepting the economy of a state in the south to which workers and industries are not likely to come without some sort of freedom to manage the wages at least at the beginning and then give these independent non-union people an opportunity to petition for higher wages after the industry is established okay but how about worker safety that you can still be a poor state and have a, a good worker safety record uh, arkansas ranks 50th by an independent study and also one more point there's 270 miles of polluted river because of chicken fecal matter. The poultry industry is the big backer of Mr. Clinton. They violated with impunity the environmental regulations. They've contributed to this campaign. They're behind him now. They give him free rides on the plane. And that's not right. And that's an environmental issue. And when you compare that to California, where we were in the forefront, people have a real choice. Here is the breakout of this audience. We, we surveyed the Clinton audience yesterday, and we surveyed you. How does this audience here gathered feel about Governor Brown and his competition. Show them, Brian. I better get over here. In this it. audience, 40% of you will, will support George Bush. 15.5% Governor Clinton, 15.5% Jerry Brown, looky here, Ross Perot, 30%. And we'll be back in just a moment. What? Over here, here. Governor, sir. What? Yes, sir. How do you expect to uh, work with these people? Great, I'm going to vote for you. How do you expect to work with these people that you're going to alienate, alienate in Washington, all those outsiders or insiders that you've devised? Well, hopefully a few of them will remove themselves during the election process. Uh, out in Chicago, uh, a, a woman was just nominated to the Democratic Party, uh, beating an incumbent Democrat on the issue of Clarence Thomas. You're going to see more of that in the Congress. And what I'd like to see next January is a, is a Congress with some new blood and with some of the old blood rejuvenated and committed to the kind of social and economic justice that the Democratic Party was founded to create. When Thomas Jefferson started this thing, he said the following, and I quote, Stop the power of the few from rioting on the labors of the many. He'd turn over on his, in his grave if he saw the way the few were financing his party. And all we're trying to do is to get it back to the original oh, intention. Governor. Yeah. Governor Brown, what yeah. are you going to do with health care programs for people that don't have health care? Uh, my goal is to have health care not as a commodity for profit, but as the right of every American citizen. That's a single-payer system, universal coverage, like they have in Canada. Yeah. With tight constraints, 
The problem is not to ration the care, it's to ration the greed. And if we remove the intermediary of the 1,500 insurance companies, we can save enough money to co cover And you want to else. put a cap, a cap on the cost of services, yeah. which would artificially limit the income of doctors. <laughs> Some, yes. Uh-huh. So yeah, why shouldn't we it's artificially? Not artificially, but it's pretty artificially increased right now. Well, but why, you know, who, else, who else would you artificially limit? Maybe you ought to ar artificially limit the uh, pay we give talk show hosts. Or ball players. <laughs> how, how much of a free market spirit... You don't operate on us except on our minds, so... Uh, how much of a free market spirit will live in a Jerry Brown presidency? Are you going to be mad at all successful, wealthy people? And incidentally, how rich will I be able to get if you become? present. And how mad at me will you be Look, at the uh, appearance of wealth? You appear, you appear to be anti-democratic, anti-free market. You must scare the hell out of Milton Friedman and a lot of the conservative economists out there. <laughs> sir, um, <laughs> sir, I ask you this seriously, sir. This is like an acupuncture of political attack. They <laughs> did, did. Oh. Look, we want we don't mind the rich getting richer, but we want the poor to get richer at the same time. And that's not what's happening. The reason I say the health care system, because in Canada, they're spending $500 per person less. Everyone's covered, and they live two years longer. We're spending 40 to 45% of tax money pouring into this health system that is so um, organized that there's tremendous incentives for over-prescription, over-medication, unnecessary operations, more visits, and paying more and more than anyone else in the whole world pays for the same thing, and our infant mortality is 50% higher than Canada, and we're living two years less. That's wrong, and I think if we stress more primary care, we can create a balance between the high-tech and the ordinary garden variety medicine and emphasize prevention and occupational environmental health, and we'll all live longer and we'll have a higher quality of life. Sir. Governor, if you become <clears throat> president, will you raise tax or lower tax? <laughs> Give I, a chance. I would revamp the tax system to take out the $350 billion of loopholes that are so obscure but have bought and been bought and paid for by the powerful people that we can have a clear, efficient, saving and investment economy in this nation. That's what the 13% is all about. And anyone who has any kind of guesses about it, take what you earned, deduct your rent or your mortgage interest, whatever you gave to charity, and multiply by 13, mm -hmm. and you're close to where you are. And it's, I will bet everyone in this room is better off. Would you support low-income housing in suburban areas to relieve the pressure on uh, urban communities? Yeah, we're, we're, we're appropriate, yeah. I mean, that's not going to... I mean, the big thing we need is get income to people, which means get jobs to people so they can pay for their rent. Low income is what you do after the social and economic system is so distorted that you have a group of people that are concentrated in one place who can't earn, who can't survive, so now you got to go to the federal government and give them some kind of free housing. I'd rather create an economy that allows people to work, earn money every month, and to get a house wherever they want it. That's the way you got to make it work. Yes, ma'am. Over here. Over here, please. Yes, I think Mr. Brown here is ridiculed a lot by media because he has different views than the norm of um, political society, but I think it's time for a change. Yes. Thank you. What is your reaction to the studio poll, and do you feel more threatened by Ross Perot? I think Ross Perot is going to get a lot of votes, yes. And it makes my point that the, that the folks in Washington don't get, they don't hear it, that the political system is unraveling. First you had Duke, then you had Buchanan, and in a very different way, and I don't compare them, you have Perot. The nice, cozy arrangement, Republican, Democrat, the little hierarchies all get together and pick their own, that is being broken down. And my candidacy is meant to provide a legitimate alternative of reform inside the Democratic Party. And I hope after this meeting we can take another vote and see if I can take that 15% and move it up a lot higher. Governor Brown, Ross Perot has made a very, very clear that he believes the Persian Gulf War was a mistake and it was the result of our beefing up Saddam Hussein all through the years, very, very uh, well detailed in a three-part series in the Los Angeles Times, I might say. Uh, and that he is essentially, he was our SOB in the 80s, and it was our uh, billions of dollars of aid that, that allowed him to survive the Iran war and threaten Kuwait. If we hadn't done that, there may not have been a need to send our young men and women to this war. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> I do. I definitely do. And we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> I, 
Uh, Brian, show him the press the last time the governor was here. Is governor that... Clinton, I just want to show you this, Governor. Governor Clinton appeared on the Donahue show uh, uh, several days before the Connecticut primary. Mm. That's the press. That's about the totality of the press just several days ago following you. Show them now, Brian. Well, here they are. This whole row. Well, well. So, uh, you've been, uh, incidentally, you're, you know, you weren't supposed to win anything. You were supposed to get out of here. Would you have anything to say to the beloved mainstream press as they gather here, weighing your every word in great numbers, may I say? <laughs> well, if we could just get the camera over here so... We could maybe ask the mainstream press some tough questions. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Here they are. No, They're I can't. all here. No, you can't. That doesn't work that way. That's, uh, hey, they report every day. Every day. They're going to have a story oh, tomorrow. we're going to be and cuddly, cuddly to the press now. <laughs> Uh-huh. All the nice, wonderful press. God no, they're forbid not. you make them mad at you. Come on, Governor. These people buried you before Connecticut. They did. Buried you. They didn't even follow you. They weren't here the last time you were here. Why don't you give them hell? Come on. Don't get wobbly, Jerry. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> what can I say? How can you attack these guys? They come out every day. Governor Brown, do you feel that this administration has put enough money into AIDS research, and what are your plans if you become president? No, it hasn't. There's good projects uh, in the medical community for research that ought to be funded, and we've got to do everything we can to end that scourge. It, it is getting bigger, it's worse, it's worldwide, and certainly our president ought to be taking much greater leadership. Less than a minute. Governor yes. Brown, you make a big issue about the insider-outsider issue, but didn't you flip-flop on term limitations? No. No. You're still for it? I support it. Yes, I think. Uh, get some people and in you'll the game have, up. you'll have a regal collection of staff people in Washington. Oh, we're going to have term That's limits on the them, too. That's where the power will go. Term limits on the staff, too? And you know what? On TV networks. <laughs> no. Yeah. Not talk yeah. shows. Uh, Every seven years, we knew the license. Yeah. Give it to a new group. If they Governor, don't Governor, I'd like produce. to go back to the gentleman's question down there about whether you're in favor of lowering or increasing taxes. You didn't answer it. You said you're going to get rid of 300,000 loopholes, which you and I both 30, know you're 30. never going to be able to do in my lifetime. My question is on capital gains tax. How do you feel about that? Look, I want to put in a 13% tax, and it would be 13% on capital gains or any other kind of income. That's, that's the proposal I make. It has as much chance of any real capital gains tax. And by the way, one other thing, 1-800-426-1112. And we'll be back in just a moment. Come and see. For a transcript of today's program, send $3 check or money order to Donahue Transcripts, 1535 Grand Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. Why doesn't Congress recognize Jesse Jackson as a senator, even though he was elected by the people? Next, Donahue. Sir. Every year, politics, they always say, I will not raise taxes, yet they still raise it. So why don't they make it just the opposite? I will raise taxes. Maybe by then, by, by then they, won't, they won't raise it at all. <laughs> Look, taxes went down during my eight years as governor. My proposal to simplify the tax code will create the saving and investment to generate the new wealth that will give us enough revenue, hopefully. That's yes. my goal. Truly, are you happy with the way the, uh, the election is going and the primary is going? Uh, I'll tell you, I can't ask for any more. They're here, you're here. Service is provided and promotional fees paid by the following.